boy, that definitely is my prayer that God would help me never to get comfortable. But man, that I would always be willing to take the next step for the Lord. You know, the easiest thing to do in the Christian life is to sit back, relax, not do anything different, don't change, just stay right where you're at. But man, my prayer is that God would help me to just wait out in it, be ready to go and do what the Lord wants me to do. And even if it's uncomfortable, keep on going. I'd like to welcome all of you to Liberty Baptist Church. And you're here on a Memorial Day weekend. We appreciate you being here. I want us to pray for all the folks that are traveling. I know tomorrow will be one of the busiest traveling days of the year. And so you keep our church in prayer and the people that come here, that God will bring them back safely for us and they'll have safe traveling mercies. I want to welcome everyone who's watching on Facebook Live. And uh, we appreciate you being uh, here and watching with us. And those that are watching online at a different time, we appreciate you taking the resources of liberty and using them uh, in your life. We've been preaching a sermon series on having a functional family. But this morning, before I get into the message, I want to say that I'm thankful to live in a free country. And I'm thankful to live in what I consider the greatest nation in the world. And it's not the greatest nation in the world because of the people who live in it per se or because of the things that we eat or the way that we conduct our lives but it's one of the greatest nations of the world because we experience a level of freedom that most countries never experience we're able to uh, worship we're able to go and to do we're able to live our lives and we're able to live a life that we can kind of do what we want to do in our life but we're not given that freedom by chance there's been calculated risk and there's been calculated sacrifice by men and women all over our nation. You know, many people get confused about Veterans Day and Memorial Day. Veterans Day is a day to, rem to remember all those who served in our military. But Memorial Day is to remember all those who have paid the ultimate price by laying down their life in service for their country. And this morning... We do that, and I just want to pause for a moment and remember that because without their sacrifice, we would not be able to live the life that we live today. And people, we, we have a tendency to cook out tomorrow and to go to the beach, go to the mountains, but I want to encourage you to remind your family, to remind your children, to remind your grandchildren so that they would grow up understanding that without the brave men and women of our armed forces serving not just in our country, but around the world, fighting war, wars all the way back to the beginning of our time as a country. If we forget that, then we rob our children of understanding what freedom really costs. And so this morning, I just want to say I'm thankful for America, and I'm thankful for those who have laid down their life. If you've ever went to Arlington, stood up there, saw the rows and rows and rows, and you realize that that's but one cemetery, but one you could go to France there's a whole America or United States cemetery there dedicated to men who died serving in France and their bodies weren't even brought back home you can go to Hawaii stand there and look over at the ship where men are buried in the sea there inside of ships understand that all those people went through what they went through so that we might have the freedom that we have and I want to encourage you to use that freedom carefully and appreciate it and love your country all right into our family series today I want to preach a message called a functional family of faith I was talking to a retired school teacher after last Sunday's sermon me and him came to a conclusion that I think should be obvious but many of us miss it there's a statement that people say all the time and I hear this all the time that we need to place God back in the schools how many people heard that saying I, I agree with that I believe God should be in the schools but you know what the problem with getting God back in the schools is God must be in your home way before he'll ever be in the schools well but two of you in here the problem with our school not having God in it is because God is not preeminently in our homes it's quiet you know we go to a, we live in a, an area that everybody goes to church I can knock on door after door after door and say hey where do you go to church at hey where do you go to church at somebody's got a church they go to now whether they really go or not that's the difference 
preacher friend of mine moved to town. He took a church. The church voted him in. He moved to that church. The church was kind of struggling. He was out knocking doors. He knocked on the door. And, man, the guy came to the door, and he said, hey, man, we're just out knocking on doors and inviting people to church, man. Love to see you and your family come to church sometime. The guy said, oh, I already have a church, Pastor. He said, where do you go? He said, well, I go to Victory Baptist Church there in Benton, Arkansas. He said, well, hi, I'm the new pastor of that church. He said, Pastor, as you can tell, I don't attend like I should. And in America, we have a tendency for everybody to be religious, but the school is not religious because truly we're not religious as people. And when I say religious, I mean God-oriented. I, I want to see the faith of us start in our home and spread out from there. You know, church is the place it starts. How many people grew up in church? Raise your hand. But how many people really grew up in church? Like, I'm talking Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, choir practice, Tuesday night, that's having something, Saturday just because we didn't have nothing else to do kind of church. You ever grow up like that? That's probably why you're in church. You see, what I find is that families of faith pass on their faith to the rest of their family. You know, I know my son-in-law is a mechanic. You know why he's a mechanic? His daddy's a heck of a mechanic. You know, he can do what his daddy does because his daddy passed it on to him. And I want you to know this today, that if our families are going to serve God and go forward for God and do things for God, it must start in our home because what you teach them at home, they will take with them to their new family. You see, the way we raise our families and the way we treat our homes as a place of faith, if we do that, if we ingrain it in them, if we instill it in them, even when they lose their mind, they'll come back to it because here's what we find, that a family of faith raising their children in faith will produce another family of faith. Amen. And I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11 is the chapter of faith. If you want to know anything about faith, you just read the book of, of Hebrews chapter 11. It is the hall of faith. Say, so what do you mean, preacher? Well, the writer is speaking about faith in verse 1. And then he begins to give us examples of people who have lived by faith all the way through the rest of the chapter. And he pulls out people from the Old Testament, and he begins to say, these people live by faith. And he tells you what they do. And man, if you're in that chapter, you know what? You did something. Because there's a lot of people in the Old Testament didn't make it in that chapter. But the people who were in that chapter, they must be somebody. Their faith was great enough that the writer said, I've got to remember the faith of this person. Now, I want you to notice with me, we're going to read verse 7. I mean, verse 1. And then we're going to read verse 7. The Bible says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful, God, to be able to be in your house today. And God, I ask you as I preach that, Lord, you will allow me to take the burden out of my heart and share it with your people this morning. God, I ask you that, God, the folks that, would be, that are listening today, whether online or in person, that, God, they would get a burden to raise their families and cause their homes to be families of faith, and that, Lord, they would press the faith forward generation to generation. Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, when you read this Hall of Faith, the Bible, and when you read this chapter, there's 40 verses in this chapter. And as I read this chapter, I got to thinking about it. There's 40 verses in the chapter number 11 dealing with faith and the people of faith. There are 22 people mentioned in this chapter. Some of them, they had to kind of infer who he was talking about because he didn't call them by name. But there's about 22 people in this chapter. But there's something that I think is crazy about this chapter. Nine of the 22 people, I mean, nine of the 22 people were direct family members. They were direct family members, and not only were they direct family members, that he goes all the way down through the Scripture, and it covers 22 verses. 22 verses of this chapter deals with one group of family members who are directly kin, 
person to person, all the way down. Say, preacher, why is that a big deal? Because I'm impressed that the family of God, uh, you notice it goes generation to generation to generation. And out of all the people they could mention, these nine family members were all included as direct kin to one another. And it proves to me that God can carry down at that faith and we can press down the faith from one generation to the next. Amen. You know, the scariest thing for your family ought to be that your generation is the last followers of Christ. Y'all don't, don't understand what I mean. Your mommy and mom and dad serve God. Maybe your grandparents serve God. Maybe you serve God. You ought to be scared to death that your children won't serve God. You say, preacher, that can't happen. It happens every day. Do you realize that folks that call themselves uh, atheists are growing at an all-time rate in America? Do you understand that people who call themselves agnostic are growing at an all-time level? Do you understand that academia and knowledge in the world is outgrowing the Christian faith and that many children are going to college as Christians and coming home as agnostic people? You say, well, my children should do better in college or the teachers should do better. How about this? Teach them better when they, so when they get to college, they don't have that problem in their life. Everybody with me? No, you're not. Some of you here want to read your Bible kids Bible stories when they're three and four years old, and that's it. That won't carry them through college. You, you know, everybody with me? So what do you mean, preacher? Listen, your kids will quit believing in the tooth fairy. Your kids will start believing in the Easter Bunny. They better never quit believing in Jesus because you didn't instill it in them. You see, the book of the Bible is not a children's book. It's for children, but not only children. You understand that your children should not hear Bible stories from you when they're three, four, and five, but as they get older in their life, you don't talk about God. You don't share God. You don't experience God with them. Listen, friends, I want you to know this, that the person that your kids trust most, whether you realize it or not, is you. And if you say it, they believe it. They do. I've told you this before. My daddy went through the grocery store when I was a little kid picking up tomatoes and shaking them, listening to them. I said, Dad, what are you doing? He said, that's how you can tell if they're ripe. You know what I started doing? I never could tell if they were ripe. You know why I believed him? He was my dad. I never forget, when I was a kid, my dad used to tell me we ate sausage. Sausage was made out of bear tails. I said, Dad, how do you know? I don't, I don't believe that. I get older, I don't believe that. He said, you ever seen a bear with a long tail? <laughs> he said, people cut them off for sausage. So you know what I do? I pass that lie along to my children. You see, I trust my dad. Why? He's my dad. Amen. Let me tell you something. Whether you believe it or not, your children believe the things you say much more than they'll believe that college professor. You say, preacher, my kids don't listen to me ever. You may not think they're listening, but they're hearing you. And friend, if you've not discussed Jesus Christ and the Word of God and the importance of the Bible with them, and I'm not talking about once in their life, this is not something you do 10 minutes out of their life. This is something you do on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, on a yearly basis. Unless you do those things, that college professor will come in and talk your child out of the faith you're trying to put in your children I'm not talking about all college professors I'm not talking about all of them just that one that he runs into just that one you know they wanted that one or maybe they go to college and run into that one friend they like them great guy great gal whatever they're friends they're good guys we drink coffee together we talk together do homework together they're good people but they're agnostic and I'm not they should not be able to talk me out of my faith you with me you shouldn't be able to talk me out of my faith. Why? Because that faith should be ingrained in me as hard as breath is. You understand that my faith in me right now is as, is as distinct in me as the breath I breathe. Friend, understand this, that it's been poured into me from a child, and I've poured it into my children. And friend, you need to pour it into your children, and you need to talk to them with your children, and work with your children, and help your children. The goal should be, just like Hebrews 11, it should be generation after generation after generation in your family that serve and worship God. God because you have poured into that child the things of God if you don't talk about God with your children I don't care what no, I'm gonna get down here half church is gone so I can just really be blunt because y'all love me if you teach your children everything but don't teach them the things of God you have failed your children 
I don't care if they turn out to be the greatest neurosurgeon the world's ever known or an astronaut or the greatest physicist that ever lived. I don't care if your kid's so smart, man, he's winning Nobel Prizes. If he doesn't know Jesus Christ and have a faith in God and serve God, we have failed as parents in our children's lives. And we're quiet about it. You know why we're quiet about it? Because we know I'm right. You know I'm right. The thing you ought to want, more, more, want most for your children is that they'll be in heaven one day and that they'll serve God as long as they live. And then anything that happens out there, that's all bonus. You know what I'm talking about? It's like when I buy a jelly-filled donut. I mean, I like the ones where the jelly doesn't bust out the side of it. But I at least want some jelly in it, don't you? And friend, I want you to know this, that the jelly of my life is my children being saved and them walking for Jesus Christ. What they do from there, praise God. I'm good with it. Understand this, church. It's on us. It's on us. Y'all can't take it. Let's go on. Let's read this. Let me show you something. How many people know who Noah is? Everybody knows who Noah is. Man, Noah had a job, didn't he? You talking about responsibility? God spoke to him out of heaven and said, "Look, son, I'm fixing to destroy everything, everything. And when I say everything, if it's breathing, it's gonna die." Amen. Noah's first thought had to be, "Oh Lord, I'm breathing." He said, "No, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to build an ark. I want you to take that ark and I want you to build it." Moses, uh, Noah had, as far as we know, never built a boat before in his life. He said, "I want you and your family to build a boat. I want you to build this boat. I want you to gather these people. I want you to preach to everybody, tell everybody, invite everybody. Get ready. Let's go. God's judgment's coming. Get on the boat. That's what I want you to do." And Noah went from being an average guy in an ordinary world uh, to having the responsibility of saving mankind. That's big time thrust into greatness. Notice we see that he was able to do that and he's remembered in this hall of faith. Why? He saved his family. He preached to a lot of people. How many people got on the boat with him? Family. How many people outside the family did he reach? But aren't you glad that he reached his family? Can you imagine Noah's feelings as he got on the boat and shut the door to know that one of his sons didn't make the trip? How difficult would it have been? Yet we live our lives here on the earth with some of our children not on the salvation boat and it seems not to bother us. Boy, it's dead this morning. Look at verse, I want you to look at verse 7 real quick. Let me show you a couple things. First of all, a family of faith hears... And believes God. The Bible says, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved. Now I want you to get this. The Bible says that God come to Noah and said, Noah, I'm going to flood the earth. I'm going to rain water down on the earth. And it's going to flood the earth. And you know what Noah's first question was? What is rain? What's this water falling from the sky you talk about? I've never seen rain before. He didn't ask God that, did he? He just started taking notes. Okay. Something called rain's coming drowned everybody to death we need to build an ark Amen. you see here's the thing I want you to get this that first of all Noah heard the word of God and church I want you to get this every man in here I can just be hard on you women I'll just not so hard on you but men you can hear the voice of God in your life and if you don't hear the voice of God in your life it's your fault you don't hear it you say preacher what do you mean I, I didn't ever answer my phone and God be on the other line that's not how God works today understand this that God's give us his word in this thing that I hold in my hand and if you want to hear from God all you got to do is open it up he's already wrote it for you and he wants to speak to you in your life and he wants to tell you what he wants you to know but if you don't read it you're never going to know what God wants for you. And let me say this, men. You ready for this? Men who don't read their Bible don't raise children who do. Now, I, I just, that's just the truth. If you want your kids to read the Bible, don't you be that hypocrite. Son, you need to read your Bible. I wouldn't ask your son to say this. He should never say this. He should never say this. But he's thinking to himself, did you read yours? You know what I mean? Everybody with me? Quiet, quiet. I could ask this question, men. I, I almost did. I almost gave out slips of paper to men this morning. I did. But, I, but, I, but I'm not, I, did, I changed my mind. I, I don't want to lose you. I want to keep you so I can love you. 
But if I ask you this question, I want you to put on a slip of paper, turn it in. Has your children ever caught you reading your Bible? Have they ever walked in on you when you were having a time with God in your Bible? And if they haven't, we got problem number one. Because if you're not hearing from God, how can you teach your kids the things of God? But not only did Noah hear God, he believed him. Some of you in here sit and hear me say things like this. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. You hear me, you hear God, but you don't believe it. So preacher, I'll believe it. My question would be, do you practice it? If you don't practice it, you know what that tells me. You don't really believe it. If you really believe the verse that said, raise up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he'll not depart from it. If you really believed it, you would train up a child in the way he should go. If you don't train him in the way he should go, it tells me you really don't believe, you're not believing what the Word says. The Word tells us that if we will raise them up, if we'll do these things, God has a blessing in store. If we will teach our kids the things of God, if we will encourage our children, if we will spend time with our children, if we, I'm not saying they won't make mistakes, but I promise you this, they'll turn out better if you do it and then they will if you don't. But some of us hear the Word, but we don't believe it. Noah heard God. And he said, boy, God said it, I believe it, let's get to it. Friend, understand this today, that God is someone we should all be listening to in our lives. I don't care what Dr. Phil has to say about how you raise your children. I don't give a rip about your grandma's memes on how to raise children. I don't care what your neighbor does with their child. If God says something different, I'm going with his way every time. Preacher, I bought this little book, How to Raise Successful Children in Nine Steps. I'm not saying it's all bad. Just probably most of it. I, you know what I get tickled by? I'm not, well, I hurt anybody's feelings. Okay, if your kids aren't worth a rip, don't tell me how to raise my children. If you ain't never had no children, I don't want to hear about raising children. And friend, if you're divorced or separated or going, don't come over and give me marriage counseling for how I should be married. I'm just telling you, some of you buying books, people ain't never been married and they tell you how to be married. Some of you buying books on how to raise children, they don't even have kids. Some of their kids in jail writing a book. I just, and we'll buy them up, boy, we love it. It makes us feel better. Well, I got this book, it's just so good. The cover, look at the cover, it's just awesome. Y'all don't care nothing about that. Throw that stuff away. Do what God says. Listen to what God says. Believe him. Feel, believe him. I got to move on quick. Verse number 7, the Bible says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear. Understand this, a family of faith hears and believes God. But number two, a family of faith fears God. Amen. Now, now, it's quiet in here. It's going to get quieter. Fear of God is important. If a family does not fear God, you'll be ignorant in the things you do. You see, the things we do and why we don't do them should not be because of social acceptance or not social acceptance. What we do in our homes and in our families should be based on one simple criteria. Is God for it? And if God ain't for it, I ain't doing it because I fear God. Amen. You said, why should I fear God? That's the same question that Pharaoh asked when Moses told him to let the people go. He said, who is your God that I should fear him? No, and Moses said, and I'm putting it in my words, I'll show you who he is. Friend, understand this, that God is God. He's a God to be feared. Why? Because he made you. He created you. He said, fear not him who can destroy the flesh, but fear him who can destroy both the soul and the flesh. Understand this today, church, that the fear of God, the Bible says, is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. 
You want a smart family? Fear God. You see, the fear of God will keep you from doing things. You know, I didn't lay in the road because my parents told me not to. You say, why didn't you go lay in the road because your parents told you? Because my parents would have whipped my butt and I was afraid of it. Amen. I'm glad because I'd have got run over. You see, when God is your, is your leader, when God is your ruler, when God is the one is the Lord of your life, there should be a fear, a healthy fear of Him and understanding what He wants is what's good for me. I'm going to give you several verses. I'm just going to read them to you because, you know, if you, you want to hear about the fear of God, go to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs says things like this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It says the fear of the Lord prolongeth days. It says the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. The Bible says better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. It says by humility and the fear of God are riches, honor, and life. And this is a verse we all ought to memorize. Let not thy heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. You know what, that's, that what he's saying there? He's saying, look here. That's what he's saying. Look here. You quit looking at your neighbor wanting everything he's got, knowing good and dang well he ain't a Christian, ain't living for the Lord. I wish I had what he had. He said, look here. It don't matter what they got. Fear God. Live for God. Be a Christian. Serve God. That's what God's saying. Don't be over there envying. Well, I want what the world's got. Quit wanting what the world's got. Just want what God wants for your life. I mean, this sermon has not been popular at all. I mean, it's just day. Everybody's looking at me like, Preacher, I knew I should have skipped. You'd have thought I was out of town. I'd have been all right. But let me give you this third thing, because I've got to be quick. I, I'm not going to keep you long. Family of faith hears and believes God, but a family of faith fears God. You ought to teach your children it's important to fear God. It's healthy to fear God. It's healthy. Your mom ever tell you, she says, Boy, I, I made you, I brought you into this world, and I'll take you out of it. You ever heard that? If you ain't, you didn't have the right kind of mama. She said, I made you, I brought you in this world, I'll take you out. You see, that's the same reason we fear God. Why? God brought us in this world. He's the one that's going to take us out. Amen. He's in control of everything in between. Fear him, serve him, live for him. Let me give you this last thing. Y'all, this will get better. This will be the happiest point of the message. The Bible says, by faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark. A family of faith follows God's plan. Now, here's the thing that's important to know about Noah. What did Noah do for a living? Does anybody know in the Bible? We, we don't know. But we do know this. He didn't build boats for a living. He, he didn't live by water. He didn't need to build a boat. He never built a boat. People say, how did in the world get a guy who's never built a boat... And, and a guy who's never been a carpenter built a boat. Well, here's how it happened. God told him what to do, and he did it. Amen. Now, I want you to get this. He followed the plan of God to build the ark. You see, God said, if you build it like this, and you build it this big, and you build it this wide, and you do this to it, and you use this kind of wood, and you use this kind of pitch, it'll float, and it'll hold the animals, you'll be fine. Noah doesn't go, you know what, I know God said build it like this, but what I'd really like is instead of just having one window in it, how many people realize the ark had one window, one, and now that, if you, how many people in here like the shades closed in your living room, how many people like that, raise your hand, don't be ashamed, how many of you are in here just like wide open windows, you want all the light, that's me, boy, I need some light, man, I don't want to be living down in no hole with, a door with all the shades drawn. I ain't got nothing to hide like some of y'all. I don't mind. Just look on in. I don't care. What are you going to see? Here's Noah. He's down here, and he's got one window. Noah says, you know what? I, I need a balcony, Dusty. I mean, I mean I'm going to be on this boat for God knows long. I'm going to build me a, a balcony out my little suite here so I can slide the door back and walk out and look out. You know, he didn't do that, did he? God said one window. What did he put in it? One. He said, how many doors was on the ark? One. God said, put one door in. Guess what he did? One door. You know what Noah figured out a long time before all this happened? He figured out that God is smarter than he is. You know what most Christians have not figured out? 
God's smarter than we are. We haven't. You know why? You know how I know this? Because we're like the dog on the chain. How many people have ever seen a dog on a chain that's been on a chain, owner takes them out, put them on a chain? Some of you may not do this anymore. It may be cruel and unusual. If it is, I'm not condoning it. I'm just saying I've seen it. They have the stake in the ground, you know what I'm talking about? And they have the lead out here, and they hook it on the dog, and the dog can run round and round the stake. Everybody know, everybody know what I'm talking about? You with me? You know one thing I've noticed about dogs, though? That dog will take off running, and he hit the end of it, his feet slam, slam out from under, and fall on the ground, right? He'll get up, he'll run back over here. Ain't too much longer, guess what happens? He runs right back out of there, what happens? It chokes him again. He flops down on the ground, jumps up, goes back, runs around. He does it over. And you know what I'm thinking to myself? About the third time, I'd be like, I can't go but this far. This thing will rip my head off. What am I doing? Yeah, you know, I see a lot of Christians, though, who they keep going back to problem and going back to the same problem and going down the same road and making the same mistakes and doing the same things over and over and over again and I want to say what are you doing didn't you learn anything from the first time haven't you looked in scripture and said God's got a better way why would I keep doing it my way when God has a better way you see God has a plan for every believers life he does it's our job to put up with it it's our job to deal with it it's our job to keep working at it and doing it his way Amen. now let me ask you a question I gotta see what time it is how long did Noah build the ark 120 everybody agree with that 120 years brother what have you ever done that long huh it's everything I can do is sit in my office and do one thing I must have ADHD or something. I get up, I walk around my office, I got my iPad, I'm just walking, working. I, I, I can't stand it, just sit right there in a little cubicle. You know what I'm talking about? I, I, mm, I can't do it. I got to go get a cup of coffee, and I got to come back, work on this a little bit, and I got to go do this, and I got to come back. And I, gotta, I mean, I just can't do it. I, he built a same boat for 120 years. Now, be honest with me. Would you be, will, would you be tempted to quit somewhere along the way? Oh, Yes. Would you be tempted to take a shortcut? I mean, we're not talking about a day where they went down a lumber store and bought lumber either, by the way. Here's you an axe. Have fun. See you in a little bit. I, I can't imagine it. You get tempted to quit. Amen. I'm going to tell you this, and, 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 and I mean this. I don't know if the Lord's going to let me preach on the family next week or not. I, I, I'm struggling in my heart whether I should or shouldn't and just move on. But, but I want you to get this. The greatest temptation that every family in this room is going to face is quitting on your children or quitting on your marriage. Now, here's how it works. You get married. You love your wife, right? You're young. you got all these hormones. It's easy. You know what I mean? You get older. You have kids. you got a stinking job that's working you to death. You're getting middle aged. Things ain't going the way you want. It's not any plan. You wake up, you're 42, and you look at your life and go, Would the 18 year old Matt be proud of this 42 year old Matt? And the answer to that question is no. He never thought I'd become a slave to the man and just do what everybody wanted me to do and just sit around and get fat and bald and watch TV. He wouldn't want that. You know? I need a new Corvette. That's what I need. Get your Corvette and a new wife. It's going to make me happy. Let me tell you something. You better stay where you're at and keep working. Stay where you're at and keep working. Yeah, but it ain't exciting like it. Well, it ain't ever, it, it ain't ever going to be as exciting. Let me tell you something, man. You go find some new girl, it's going to be exciting for 20 minutes. After about a year, you know what? It's the same old thing. All the newness done wore off. Now you're just getting up every day, going to work, just like you always have been. Look here, don't get discouraged and quit. Let me tell you, the reason you leave your wife, you quit quit well preacher I just I'm tired of putting this tired, tired that's the key word don't you quit Noah can build an ark for 120 years you can stay married for 50 quit why don't come to me tell me how hard marriage is I don't even want to hear it preacher you just don't know how hard it is it ain't digging a ditch in 98 degree weather hard I'll tell you that it ain't being tortured by some foreign government hard either you're just a weenie. Get ready and serve God. Get your wife. Go to work. I mean, what's wrong with you? Suck it up. 
come tell me how hard it is to be married. I don't want to hear that. You think you're the only person ever experienced it? Think you're going to be the only person ever experienced it? No. Yeah, you're like, no, I busted my finger. I hit my hammer. I'm going to quit building this boat. Shut up, build a boat. Shut up and be married. Shut up. Don't nobody need to hear your problems either, by the way. You know the worst person to be around is? Somebody separated from their spouse. That's all they want to tell you about. How terrible she was, he was, whatever. Look here, we ain't buying that. We ain't buying it. Go to work. Work on your marriage. Get it up, go. Let's go. Get it done. No, don't quit. Let me tell you something. Anybody in this room has been married for 50 years, they, 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 it, it's in spite of their circumstances. It wasn't because they had this perfect marriage. It's because they just determined their life. Look, we ain't quitting. I told my wife, you leave me, I'll just follow you. You move out, I will too. I'll set up a tent in the front yard wherever you go. I don't care. I ain't got, I'm done. 26 years, I ain't starting over. It ain't happening. Mm -mm. When I said forever, I meant till I die. And it's about to kill me. No, I'm just kidding. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm just speaking. I might die here a little bit, but not right now. Amen. And let me tell you about your children. Your children are going to try to kill you too. Not, not necessarily what's going to happen. You're going to have two or three kids. They're going to be easy, and you're going to get lulled into that. You're going to get lulled into it. You're going to get lulled, slammed to sleep with it, and you're going to start just because those three are easy. You're just going to think everybody's on autopilot. You know what I mean? We're just going to put it on autopilot. But look, if your kid, if you suspect, you just... I tell you what, if you've got a teenage kid, you need to go to Walgreens, just buy you a couple drug tests. I'm not lying to you. You just need to just bust up in the house one day and say, hey, I need you to pee in this. You say, well, I trust my kids. Well, quit it. Quit trusting them. I'm not saying be mean to them. I'm just saying don't trust them. Hey, but what if it comes back clean? Well, praise the Lord. But you know what you let them know? I'm in your business. I'm up in your life. Yes, I am. So, preacher, would you do that? In a heartbeat. In a heart. What's $26 so I can sleep good at night? Huh? You know what happens, though? We give up. We quit. Well, he's 18, preacher. Well, he's 19. Well, I'm just, you know, I, I've done all I can do. No, you ain't. You still breathing? Yeah, fog this mirror up. You can fog it up, get to work. Well, I've tried everything. You still breathing? You ain't tried everything. Keep working. Keep working. You say, well, you just don't know my kids. I don't care. Preacher, you just don't know my circle. I, it's, I, it's not that I don't know them. I don't care. It don't matter where you find yourself. It doesn't matter what child you've got. If God gave them to you, they're your responsibility. Get up, go to work, and take care of your children and train them. Don't you quit on them. The worst thing you can do is quit on your children. You say, preacher, I've done everything and everything and everything. They still ain't, they still ain't turned. Keep working. Keep working. Well, they're 30 years old. I don't care if they're 50 years old. If you're still breathing, your kid's still in the wrong place, you do everything. Now, your strategy's got to change once they move out, but you still ought to keep working on them and working with them and trying with every breath you have. It's your job to be an example and to live for God and to teach them and encourage them and never quit on them. They should never see quit in you. Never. 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 You know, I'm going to say this, and I'm, some, some of us parents could learn from parents that have children with disabilities. You hear me? You know, I'm going to get real with you right now. See, a lot of us, when our kids get 18, 19, they're done anyway. They go off to college, and they go from college, they go to work, they, you know, they do the thing. People with children have severe disabilities, guess what? They're a parent of that child how long? How long do they take care of that child? As long as it takes. Do whatever it takes. Why? It, would they quit? Would they be willing to say, well, I'm done now. I mean, you know, I've been doing this for 26 years. I'm just going to quit. No. Why is it we do that spiritually with our children? If, you're, if your child's not spiritually in place, they ought to be. You don't quit on them. You go till the job is done. Just done. I got a lot more I want to say. I ain't got time to say it. But I want to put this in you, church. You want your children to be a fan, uh, to grow up and live for the Lord like you do or like you appear to or like the way you want to? Let me tell you this. You better get in God's Word and hear it. Amen. You better respond to that Word and be ready to serve. And let me tell you this. You better never, ever, ever quit. Your kids ought not to ever ride by your house on a Sunday morning. You'd be sitting in the driveway. 
Let me tell you, so that's my greatest fear. That my kids say one day, well, my dad used to serve God. My dad used to be a preacher. My dad used to serve the Lord. It ought not ever be that way. No neighbor of yours ought to ride by and see your truck in the driveway at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. Unless you got the flu or dead. Your kids ought to be able to say, you know what? Sunday morning, I'm in Indonesia. It's Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, and in York, South Carolina, my parents are somewhere in a church worshiping Jesus. Amen. Like clockwork. Clockwork. Father, I come to you. Lord, you know my burden of what I want to preach, Lord. I can't get it all out. I can't even really express it the way I want to. Lord, I just want to see that no generation grow up and not know God. Lord, they grow up and want to serve you and live for you. God, I just want you to pass that burden to our church. They see their kids as their greatest resource, their greatest need, the greatest blessing God's ever given them, but their greatest responsibility. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, no one's looking around as the musicians begin to play. I'm going to open this altar up here in a minute with just a simple challenge today. Where's your family on the faith scale? Would the writer of Hebrews write you down? Would he write your children down? Or would he skip over you? You realize that the country of England is where the people that settled this country primarily came from. And when they got here, they brought Bibles with them and established churches and it's how we became known as one nation under God. I don't know if you know this or not, but America today sends missionaries to England to take the gospel to them. It's possible for our nation to fall in that same condition, but not if God returns to our families and we begin to pass it down generation to generation. As we stand to our feet, heads are bowed, no one's looking around. As they sing a verse of invitation, you come. Don't you wait, you step out right now. Find a place around this altar. Sing that first verse of Amazing Grace. You sing it out with them as they sing. You're not singing. I can't hear you. Oh, 